Hello, welcome back to Skyrim Storytime. This time I'm going to be reading The Cabin in the Woods. It says Volume 2, but I'm almost certain that this is the only volume that's in the game. Considering when you hover over it, it says The Cabin in the Woods, with no version number next to it. So here we go. As told by Mogan, son of Moleg. Late one night, a few seasons ago, a soldier was returning home after several bloody battles. He decided he would save some gold and decided to cross the pine forest on foot. The first day of his journey was rather uneventful. The soldier stuck to the main path and kept a brisk pace. When it started getting dark, he set up his bedroll, built a small fire, and cooked a s and cooked up some rabbit he had caught. A fine day indeed, he thought to himself as he fell asleep. Partway through the evening, the soldier was woken by the soft sobbing and by soft sobbing in the distance. He grabbed his sword, assuming it to be a bandit trick, but pretended to sleep so he could get the jump on them. After a few minutes, the sobbing started moving away from his camp until he could no longer hear it. For the rest of the night, he slept with one eye open. Day two, the soldier, soldier awoke from what rotten sleep he could catch and started off through the forest at a quicker pace intending to put distance between himself and whatever he had heard last night. As the day went on, it began to rain heavy, so the soldier built himself a little shelter for the evening so he could remain dry while he slept. It took him a little longer to fall asleep with the thoughts of the previous night fresh in his mind, but he eventually slept. This time, he awoke to sobbing that sounded like it was right outside his shelter. The soldier grabbed his sword and crawled out of the shelter. In front of the fire, he saw the back of a ghostly woman sobbing into her hands. The soldier mustered his courage and asked her what was wrong. No answer. He began to slowly approach, but before he could reach her, she turned and screamed at him. The ghostly woman raised an axe and began to run at the soldier, disappearing before she made contact. The soldier took off into the night with just his sword in hand. He ran until the first light of dawn where he started down the road again, as fast as he could move. The third day was bright and sunny, but the soldier, rattled and sleepless, didn't even notice. He moved as fast as he could, trying to get through the forest before nightfall. As darkness began to fall, he saw a cabin just off the road and thought to himself it would be a, gr a good place to bunker down for the night. After arriving at the cavern, he spent some time blocking the doors and windows. Nothing would get in. Despite his pre preparations, he could not sleep. He sat in what used to be the cabin's bedroom, staring at the barricaded door, shaking. Eventually. He could keep his eyes open no longer and fell asleep. This time, he awoke to laughing on the other side of the barricaded door. It sounded like the woman from before, but he refused to believe it was her. The soldier burst through the barricaded door into the main room to find the ghostly woman from the night before staring at the ground laughing hysterically with axe in hand. He began to relentlessly attack the ghostly woman, but he could feel his strikes were less effective. He used a scroll of fire which drew a scream from her and she exploded, disappearing. The ordeal was over and the ghost was gone. The soldier slept well that night and the next day made excellent distance through the woods. As the sun began to set, he came out on the other side of the forest and looked back, remembering the days before. As he turned and started walking away from the woods, he could swear he heard the sobbing again. The end. Good night. Hello everyone. I've just come across what looks like a very interesting book in my travels. The Woodcutter's Wife. And I thought that I'd give it a read for uh, Skyrim Storytime. Let's begin. The Woodcutter's Wife, Volume 1, as told by Mogan, son of Molig. 
Legend tells of a woodcutter who built a shack deep within the pine forest. There, he hoped to live in peace with his family. The woodcutter's family lived well for a time, but without warning, the weather turned bitterly cold and spoiled the harvest. Before long, with their meager supply of food all but gone, the family was starving. Late one snowy night, a traveler knocked on the cabin door, seeking shelter from the bitting, biting cold. Always generous of heart, the woodcutter welcomed the stranger into his home, apologizing that he had no food to offer. With a smile, the traveler cast off his cloak to reveal the garments of a mage. As the woodcutter and his family looked on, the mysterious visitor reached into his satchel and withdrew a scroll tied with a silver ribbon. No sooner had the wizard unfurled the scroll and read the words aloud, when a great feast appeared from out of thin air. That night, nobody in the woodcutter's cabin went hungry. Day by day, the snow piled up. Every night, the mage produced another scroll from his bag and read the words, each time summoning a new feast. On the fifth night, the woodcutter's wife awoke her husband to confess her mistrust of their magical guest. Surely, she argued, there was some price to pay for the magical feast that everyone enjoyed night after night. The woodcutter would have, have none of it. After nearly dying from lack of food, his family was eating well. The divines had sent them a gift, he explained, and it was foolish to question their wisdom. But the woodcutter's wife would not be persuaded. Every night she grew more fearful, fearful and more desperate. She was certain that the family had entered into a devil's bargain, and the time would soon come for the, when the mage would ask for something unspeakable in return for his gifts. While everyone in the cabin slept, the woodcutter's wife snuck out of bed and took her husband's axe in hand. She crept into the traveler's room, and with one swing, lopped off his head. Suddenly, the wizard's disembodied head awoke. His eyes opened wide, and when he beheld his maimed body, he let forth a terrible cry. Awakened by the horrified scream, the woodcutter and his children rushed into the room and gasped at the terrible sight of the decapitated mage. With his last gasp of breath, the traveler laid a fearful curse on the woodcutter's wife. After her mortal death, she was damned to rise once again and walk the woods only walk the woods alone only to be burnt at the rising of the sun. To this day, those who walk the pine forest late at night tell tales of a weeping woman glimpsed between the trees. She carries a bloody axe, the stories say, and is terrifying to behold. Ha! Huh. Could that possibly be the weeping woman that had the axe who was in the forest from the last book that we read? I'm seeing some reoccurring themes here. Well, hope you enjoyed the story. A little bit uh, on the spooky side, I suppose. But uh, good nonetheless. Hope you enjoyed, and good night. Hello, welcome back to Skyrim Storytime. I found two interesting looking books here, and I think I'm going to try to get both of them in if I can. If not, then probably one each. Beggar Prince. Please remember that I'm uh, sight reading, so to say. Uh, so to speak, sight reading these. Uh, I've never read them before, so if I fall over a couple of words, then I apologize. Beggar Prince, the story of Weedle and his gifts from the Daedric Lord Namira. We look down upon the beggars of the Empire. These lost souls are the poor and wretched of the land. Every city has beggars. Most are so poor they have only the clothes on their backs. They eat the scraps the rest of us throw out. We toss them a coin so that we don't have to think too long about their plight. Imagine my surprise when I heard the tale of the beggar prince. I could not imagine what a prince of beggars would be. Here is the tale I heard. It takes place in the first age when gods walked like men and Daedra stalking the wilderness with impunity. 
It is a time before they were all confined to oblivion. There was once a man named Weedle, or maybe it was a woman. Hm. The story goes to great lengths to avoid declaring Weedle's gender. Weedle was the thirteenth child of a king in Valenwood. As such, Weedle was in no position to take the throne or even inherit much property or wealth. Weedle had left the palace to find independent fortune and glory. After many days, the endless forest roads and tiny villages, Weedle came upon a three men. Came upon a three men. Grammar errors. <sighs> After many days of endless forest roads and tiny villages, Weedle came upon three men surrounding a beggar. The beggar was swaddled in rags from head to toe. No portion of the vagabond's body was visible. The men were intent on slaying the beggar. With a cry of rage and indignation, Weedle charged the men, men with sword drawn. Being simple townsfolk, armed only with pitchforks and scythes, they immediately fled from the armored figure with a shining sword. Many thanks for saving me, wheezed the beggar, from beneath the heap of a foul rags. Of foul rags. Weedle could barely stand the stench. What is your name, wretch? Weedle asked. I am Namira. Unlike the townsfolk, Weedle was well learned. That name meant nothing to them, but to Weedle it was an opportunity. You are a Daedric Lord, Weedle exclaimed. Why did you allow those men to harass you? You could have slain them all in a whisper. I am pleased you recognize me, Namira rasped. I am frequently reviled by townsfolk. It pleases me to be recognized for my attribute, if not for my name. Weedle knew that Namira was the Daedric Lord of all things gross and repulsive. Diseases such as leprosy and gangrene were her domain. Where others might have seen danger, Weedle saw opportunity. Oh, great Namira, let me apprentice myself to you. I ask only that you grant me powers to make my fortune and forge a name for myself that will live through the ages. Nay, I make my way alone in the world. I have no need for an apprentice. Namira shambled off down the road. Weedle would not be put off. With a bound, Weedle was at Namira's heel, pressing the case for an apprenticeship. For thirty-three days and nights, Weedle kept up the debate. Namira said nothing, but Weedle's voice was ceaseless. Finally, on the thirty-third day, Weedle was too hoarse to talk. Namira looked back on the suddenly silent figure. Weedle knelt in the mud at her feet, open hands raised in supplication. It would seem you have completed your apprenticeship to me after all, Namira declared. I shall grant your request. Weedle was overjoyed. I grant you the power of disease. You may choose to be inflicted with any disease you choose, changing them at will, so long as it has visible symptoms. However, you must always bear at least one. I grant you the power of pity. You may evoke pity in anyone that sees you. Finally, I grant you the power of disregard. You may cause others to disregard your presence. Weedle was aghast. These were not boons from which a fortune could be made. They were curses, each awful in its own right, but together they were unthinkable. How am I to make my fortune and forge a name for myself with these terrible gifts? As you begged at my feet for thirty-three days and thirty-three nights, so shall you now beg for your fortune in the cities of men. Your name will become legendary among the beggars of Tamriel. The story of Weedle, the Prince of Beggars, shall be handed down throughout the generations. It was as Namir predicted. Weedle was an irresistible beggar. None could see the wretch without desperately wanting to toss a coin at the huddled form. However, Weedle also discovered that the power of disregard gave great access to, the s access to the secrets of the realms. People unknowingly said important things where Weedle could hear them. Weedle grew to know the comings and goings of every citizen in the city. To this day, it is said that if you really want to know something, go ask the beggars. They have eyes and ears throughout the cities. 
They know all the little secrets of the daily lives of its citizens. The end. Hi guys! I'm going to be reading another book for uh, our Skyrim story time. So go ahead, I'll give you a second. Get all comfy. You can fluff your pillow up. And sit back, I suppose. Something. Get comfortable. We're reading The Cake at the Diamond by Ethan Wendell. Wendell. Hey, Athen? Athen. Whatever. I was in the rat in the pot, a foreigner corner club in the Aldrun, talking to my fellow rats when I first saw the woman. Now, Breton women are fairly common in the rat in the pot. As a breed, they seem inclined to wander far from their perches in High Rock. Older Breton women, however, are not so migratory, and the wizened old Biddy drew attention to herself wandering about the room, talking to everyone. Nimloth and Odiad were at their usual places, drinking their usual stuff. Odiad was showing off a prize he had picked up in some illicit manner, a colossal diamond, large as a baby's hand, and clear as spring water. I was admiring it when I heard the creaking of old bones behind me. "'Good day to you, friends,' said the old woman. My name is Abel Treatit, and I am in need of financial assistance to facilitate my transportation to Aldredania. You'll, You'll want to see the temple for charity, said Nimloth curtly. I am not looking for charity, said Abel. I'm looking to barter services. Don't think me sick, old woman, laughed Odiad. Did you say your name was Abel Credit? I asked. Are you related to Abel Credit, the High Rock Alchemist? Closely related, she said with a cackle. We are the same person. Perhaps I could prepare you a potion in exchange for gold? I noticed that you have in your possession a very fine diamond. The magical qualities of diamonds are boundless. Sorry, old woman, I ain't giving it up for magic. I was trouble enough sleeping this one. It was trouble enough stealing this one, said Odiad. I've got a fence who will trade it for gold. But your fence will demand a certain percentage, will he not? What if I could give you a potion of invisibility in exchange? In return for that diamond, you could have the means to steal many more. A very fair exchange of services, I would say. It would be. But I have no gold to give you, said Oedid. I'll take what remains of the diamond after I've made the potion, said Abel. If you took it to the Mage's Guild, you have to supply all the other ingredients and pay for it as well. But I learned my craft in the wild, where no potion makers existed to dissolve diamonds into dust. When you must do it all by hand, by simple skill, you are blessed with the remnants of those fool potion makers at the guild simply swallow up. That sounds all very nice, said Nimloth. But how do we know your potion is going to work? If you make one potion, take the rest of Odiad's diamond and leave, we won't know until you've gone whether the until you you've gone whether the potion works or not. Ah, uh, trust is so rare these days, sighed Abel. I suppose I could make two potions for you, and there'd still be a little bit of the diamond left for me. Not a lot, but perhaps enough to get me to Ald Redania. Then you could try the first potion right here and now, and see if you're satisfied or not. But, I interjected, you could make one potion that works and one that doesn't, and take more of the diamond. She could even give you a slow-acting poison, and by the time she got to... Aldredania, you'd be dead. Bleeding Kinnereth, you dumber are suspicious. I will hardly have any diamond left, but I could make two potions of two doses each, so you can satisfy yourself that the potion works and has no negative side effects. If you still don't trust me, come along with me to my table and witness my craft if you'd like. 
So it was decided that I would accompany Abel back to her table where she had all her traveling bags full of herbs and minerals to make certain that she was not making two different potions. It took nearly an hour of preparation, but she kindly allowed me to finish her half-filled flagon of wine while I watched her work. Splintering the diamond and powdering the pieces required the bulk of the time. Over and over again she waved her gnarled hands over the gem, intoning ancient enchantments, breaking the facets of the stone into smaller and smaller pieces. Separately she made paste of minced bitter green, crushed red bulbs of Del Arcos Bay, and driblets of Siciliani oil. I finished the wine. Old woman, I finally said with a sigh, how much longer is this going to take? I'm getting tired of watching you work. The Mages Guild has fooled the populace into thinking alchemy is a science, she said. But if you're tired, rest your eyes. My eyes closed, seemingly of their own volition. But there had been something in that wine, something that made me do what she asked. I think I'll make up the potion as cakes. It's much more potent that way. Now tell me, young man, what will your friends do once I give you the potion? Mug you in the street afterwards to retrieve the rest of the diamond, I said simply. I didn't want to tell the truth, but there it was. I thought so, but I wanted to be certain. You may open your eyes now. I opened my eyes. Abel had made a small presentation of a wooden platter, two small cakes and a silver cutting knife. Pick up the cakes and bring them to the table, said Abel. And don't say anything except to agree with whatever I say. I did as I was told. It was a curious sensation. I didn't really mind being her puppet. Of course, in retrospect, I resent it but it seemed perfectly natural at the time to obey without question. Abel handed the cakes to Odiad, and I dutifully verified that both cakes were made the same way. She suggested that he cut one of the cakes in half, and she would take one piece, he'd take the other, just so he would know that, the, that they worked and weren't poisoned. Odiad thought it was a good idea, and used Abel's knife to cut the cake. Abel took the piece on the left and popped it into her mouth. Odia took the piece on the right and swallowed it more cautiously. Abel and all of the bags she was carrying vanished from sight almost instantly. Nothing happened to Odia. Why did it work for the witch and not for me? cried Odia. Because the diamond dust was only on the left-hand side of the blade, said the old alchemist through me. I felt her control lessening as the distance grew, and she hurried in down the dark Aldrun street away from the rat in the pot. We never found Abel, credit, oh, we never found Abel or the diamond, whether she completed her pilgrimage to Aldrudania as anyone, was anyone's guess. The cakes had no effect, except to give Odia a bad case of the droops that lasted nearly a week. Clever, clever mage, clever mage.